I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, this book I wrote uh, called The Water Will Come. I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I came to write it, a little bit about what I learned, and then we will do some open up for some questions and all that. I have some slides I want to go through um, sort of quickly. Um, but the first thing I want to say in talking about this is that I've written about climate change uh, for Rolling Stone and others for almost 20 years now, a long time, and watched a lot of changes in politics and how we think about this and in the, the, how the media thinks about this. But I didn't start out that way. I didn't start out as a kid thinking about I want to grow up to be a climate journalist. Um, I grew up uh, in Silicon Valley um, <laughs> uh, in a place that was apricot orchards one moment. The next moment, it was, it was uh, you know, Ferraris driving around everywhere. I was like, what the hell happened here? Um, I, I went to, the, to work for this little company that um, my mom worked for. I remember when she got the job, she said, Jeff, I, she never worked before. My parents got divorced. She needed a job. She, she came back, answered to one ad, said, I got a job for a little company called Apple. And I'm like, <laughs> you're kidding. You're not really serious about a job with a place called Apple, are you? And she said, yeah, it's really cool. And uh, it was pretty cool. There was like 17 people working there. And Steve Jobs was still barefoot and uh, running around quoting Bob Dylan lyrics. Um, and, and I got a job there. And um, I spent uh, about a year when I was you know, a teenager working there doing silly stuff. Uh, and just to show you, when you think about my talking about the future and all that, I want, you to, I want this to be clear. I was at Apple, and I was sitting there at the desk, and I was thinking, this company is nowhere. Nothing, this place, this company is never going to go anywhere. I got to go do something interesting, because this company is really going to fail. So I left. Uh, I went to Lake Tahoe and dealt blackjack. Um, <laughs> but but uh, I ended up, for a long story, getting into journalism. And I ended up writing. I've written a lot of stuff for Rolling Stone. In fact, spent a lot of time actually writing about Apple later and about um, uh, Steve Jobs and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, but my, so my entry into journalism was not through, at all through environmentalism or science, even for that matter. And in fact, um, I didn't start thinking about science or climate change until um, 2000, the year 2000, or 2001, actually, just after George W. Bush was elected president. And um, uh, the New York Times called me up and said, um, we think that coal is going to make a big comeback. We'd like you to write, go down to West Virginia and write a story for the New York Times Magazine about the comeback of the coal industry. And I remember sitting in my, in my, at my desk thinking, coal? What are you talking about? We don't burn coal in America. What do you, that went out with Charles Dickens. What are you talking about? I thought electricity kind of poured down from a golden bowl in the sky. And, but of course, I didn't say that to my editor. I said, yeah, that's a great idea. I'm going to go. <laughs> so I did, and I went down to. West Virginia, and I spent a month or so there um, writing about the coal industry, and it really opened my eyes um, because I didn't know that we burned coal. At that time, we burned about half of our electricity came from coal. Um, the whole thing of mountaintop removal mining and air pollution and global warming, all that kind of stuff completely changed my life. It was like, you know, I had spent all this time celebrating electrons with that Steve Jobs was eating on the white, nice white um, iPads and iPods and computers and everything, and never thought about where those electrons came from. I uh, ended up writing um, a book about that. That magazine story turned into a book called Big Coal, which was about the coal industry, power of the coal industry, consequences of burning coal. And I sort of never looked back as a journalist from, from that moment on. But I realized that. For me, climate change is the big story of our time. And it's the thing that I really wanted to spend all of my time as a journalist writing about. And I pretty much have. And I've written many, many stories for Rolling Stone. And I wrote another book, um, which Fraser mentioned, called How to Cool the Planet, about geoengineering. And then this um, most recent book um, about sea level rise. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about this, how this came to be. I had written a lot about climate change, many different aspects of it, many different aspects of energy. But I never thought about sea level rise, really. I mean, I knew sea level rise was an issue. Um, but I always thought it was sort of a long, slow, gradual thing that, you know, end of the century, you know, it'll be slow. We'll have plenty of time to think about it. No big deal. And then Hurricane Sandy hit New York. And I was wandering. I wasn't in the city that, uh, at that time, but I was there the next day after the water receded. And um, I was wandering around looking at the waterlogged Lower East Side and all that. And I called a friend who was a scientist at um, Columbia. 
And we were talking about the consequences of this and how to, what I, how to write about it and things. And he said, well, one way to think about what you are seeing on the Lower East Side is as a sort of dress rehearsal for sea level rise. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, the high end possible estimates for sea level rise by the end of the century are seven or eight feet. They've been amended now, but that, uh, that's what he said at the time. And that's about how much water came into the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And he said, so imagine that water came in and instead of receding after two hours, stayed there. I was like, whoa. That's a pretty scary idea. And he said, well, he said, you really want to blow your mind. You should have that same thought experiment in Miami. And I was like, why? And he said, go and you'll see. So I went and I saw. Um, and I arrived in Miami on a sunny day during high tides. And I saw three feet of water in parts of Miami Beach just because of the high tides. And I was there literally for 24 hours. And within 24 hours, it was very clear to me that um, anyone who takes sea level rise seriously in any way, Miami, as we know today, is in big, big, big trouble. Um, because you have a lot of real estate built right on the water. You have very, the whole topography of South Florida is like a pancake. And it's built on Swiss cheese. The limestone there is a kind of porous limestone called oud limestone. That means that you can't build seawalls in the same way as you can in other places. So if you try to build a seawall, the water will just go right underneath and come up the other side. So this took me about 24 hours to figure out with the help of a couple of geologists, friends of mine. Uh, well, they weren't at the time, they are now, um, who helped me see this. Um, and I wrote a, a story for Rolling Stone uh, with the very subtle title, um, Goodbye Miami. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I always tell my kids that if, if I end up like in a ditch, you know, a car with the brake lines cut like Karen Silkwood, you know, the nuclear, to go talk to the Miami Real Estate Association um, <laughs> because they were not happy with this idea that, you know, Miami is in big trouble and that real estate values might take a hit. Um, but that, but this, this experiment, is, this is a, what I saw when I was on that first trip. And, but that made me think about, okay, well, if Miami's in so much trouble, what about the rest of the world? And that's where this book was born in thinking about the consequences of sea level rise for the rest of the world. And what are other cities doing? Are other cities in as much trouble as Miami? And how is it different? And how are the politics different? So I spent a couple of years going around the world. Um, this is a kid I met in Lagos, great kid. Um, Lagos was a really important, I went to the water slums, spent a couple of weeks in the water slums of Lagos. It was a really important trip for me because it was where I really realized that the problem with sea level rise um, is um, that we have this idea that the water is here and the land is here and forever that is how it will be. In that, and so we build things with the idea that the water is always going to be there and the land is always going to be there. And it's a problem of all of this built infrastructure we've built with this idea that there's no changing. You talk to people in Lagos about what would you do if you have four feet of sea level rise and they're like, I don't care, we can fix our, raise our houses in the afternoon, no big deal. We're totally adaptable because they have a kind of infrastructure, not glamorous maybe, but the kind of infrastructure that is very flexible. And we've built all of this stuff, the Fontainebleau Hotel in Miami, you know, downtown Newport, all this stuff is built with the idea that the water is here and the land is there. So that idea of sort of fixed infrastructure and the, um, was something that I learned very clearly in, in Lagos. Uh, I went to um, the Marshall Islands where sea level rise is not just a real estate issue or an inconvenience about your beach, it's a sort of existential question when you, under any kind of sea level rise projections, uh, a lot of these Pacific Islands are gone. And when they're gone, what does that mean for the people? The people there are beginning to think about it. It's a sort of existential crisis. What happens to our language, our culture, our fishing rights, all kinds of things, right? So that was part of it. I went to Venice, uh, long known as the um, you know, sinking city because it's been subsiding for a long time. My first, I'd been to Venice before as a kid and things, but one of the first things when I got to Venice, I was like, it was so beautiful. It was, a, it was like a day like this, and the water's glistening. I'm like, this is how cities should all be. We made a mistake building cities on the land. It's so great being in a city on water. And you know, it's true, Venice is a great example of how you can build cities in a different way. The problem with Venice is that um, it's, it's, besides the sort of subsiding things, it's this architectural jewel. One of the um, people who, uh, the head of engineering for the city, explained to me that in the old days, 
they used to just keep building on top of things. So when you, when you drill down and start to put a foundation in, when you're building in Venice now, you hit Marco Polo's house, then you hit Marco Polo's grandfather's house, and then you hit, and on, all the way down. But you can't do that anymore because you can't knock anything down. And so you have this gem that you can't change or touch, and yet the water is coming in. And I'll talk a little bit about a barrier they're trying to build around there. But, so Venice was very interesting to me. Uh, I went and spent three days in Alaska with this guy, uh, who you might recognize. Um, we talked um, a lot about climate change and sea level rise for a Rolling Stone story um, that ended up also being in the book. It's very surreal thinking about that conversation now, about spending three days with the President of the United States talking about climate change and thinking. But it's not as surreal as thinking about what that conversation would be like with our current President. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I guess exactly right. <laughs> Three minutes, right? <laughs> so if I could distill some of the things, the questions that were important for thinking about sea level rise and for me thinking about the book and how, and how to write about this and, and how as residents and people who live on the coast, what you, we need to know. The big question is, you know, the water is going to come, the question is how high and how fast. So one of the things that's really um, was important for me to stress as a writer and as a journalist talking about this is that the book is called The Water Will Come. It's not called The Water Will Come unless we all put solar panels on our roofs, right? The, the idea that's very important to grasp is that we have a certain amount, a lot of sea level rise already built in because of the warmth that we've already added to the atmosphere that's been absorbed by the oceans. So no matter what we do, no matter how good of citizens we become, no matter how much AOC talks about the Green New Deal and all that kind of thing, and we, how much we do that, we are still going to see significant amounts of sea level rise. The last time temperatures and CO2 levels were where they are today, we, the sea levels were 30 feet higher. So when we get to a kind of thermal equilibrium, that's sort of where we're going. Whether that will take 100 years or 300 years, no one knows for sure. Most scientists would say that even if we stop CO2 emissions right now, we're still have at least four feet by the end of the century, maybe more, if we stop emissions now, and it goes up higher from that. Doesn't mean that stopping emissions is not important, but it does mean that we can't think we're going to fix this by all of a sudden getting our act together on carbon emissions. So the question then is how high and how fast? It's one thing if you have six feet of sea level rise over 200 years, it's like, oh yeah, we can deal with that. I'll gradually move everything back and it's all fine. If you have six feet of sea level rise in 30 years, that's a whole different thing, right? So this question of, of how high and how fast is really, really central. And it's a question that I do not have an answer for and neither does anybody else. Um, but I, I wanted to show this real quickly, just, just and maybe some of you have seen this, but this is just the sort of real time temperatures uh, of, of the planet from 1880 to, uh, to today, just to show you where the warmth is. And it, it goes a long way towards showing uh, why sea level rise is an issue. You'll notice where the warming uh, has, is happening as, as time goes on. We don't see much yet, but watch what happens as we get closer to our time. We're at 1950 now, and look what happens up, especially in the north, in, in the Arctic. And this is not a model, this is real temperature So there we are. So look at the north, right? That's the Arctic, right? And you can see a little bit of warming down in, in Antarctica down below on the Antarctic Peninsula. But when we think about sea level rise, the issue is not expansion of the oceans, although that has been part of it historically. It's not what's happening at Kilimanjaro or land glaciers. It's what's happening in Greenland, basically, and on, in Antarctica, the two big ice cubes at the poles of the planet. That's the issue. And here you can see that we have, for reasons that I don't really have time to go into, exceptional warming uh, in the poles. So the question is, so we keep getting these, the, the question is how much, um, how much sea level rise we're gonna get and how fast, as I, as I said. And, and the models keep getting higher and higher. They keep, they keep, they, the, the more we understand ice dynamics, the higher the risks are getting. And this is just showing you some variations of of some of the models 
On the right, you see that's uh, um, nine feet, and, and you can see these, they're kind of all over the place, but as time goes on, they're, they're getting higher. And the reason, basically, um, that, that the, oh, so let me show you this. This is just, I want to show you what um, seven feet of sea level rise means. Right now, the high ends for the end of the century from NOAA is eight feet. And this is what seven feet means just in, in Miami. And you can see Miami Beach is underwater even with seven feet of, of it. But what's really interesting is the way the water comes in from the Everglades, from the west. So all these people out here, I have a pointer here, I don't know how that works, but all these people out here in still water on the far left, Miami Springs, uh, where our president has a uh, golf course in Doral, um, places like that are in huge risk of inundation, and they have no idea. They think, oh, well, we're six miles from the coast. Why, do, why should we worry? In fact, the water comes in from that way as, as fast as it comes in from the Atlantic coast. And it also has enormous implications for the restoration of the Everglades, um, which is not something I'm going to go into right now. But um, this is just to show you what seven feet means. Uh, I just did a quick thing about what uh, things look like here. It's not, this is obviously not Miami Beach. Um, but this is showing you uh, three feet of sea level rise. You're already getting in. And notice how it comes up in the rivers. Uh, also, it backs up in obviously low-lying areas along the coast. You can see Newport Harbor, even with three feet of sea level rise um, uh, flooding out. And then this is six feet. And you can see Newport is, with six feet even is in, is in really big trouble. I think we're OK here, barely, uh, as, I, as I zoomed in. Uh, it looked like we were like the, the waves would be lapping out here, uh, or pretty close to it. Um, uh, but you can see that even, even um, it, it isn't, you don't have to wait until there's like sharks swimming through the lobby of the Hilton Hotel <laughs> before there's problems, right? It's already, even small amounts of sea level rise uh, are, have enormous issues for coastal places. But I want to go back to this question of the, of the um, risks getting higher. So when I started thinking about climate change and writing about this even in, in a general way 10 years ago, people were thinking three feet. That was what the IPCC report was saying for the end of the century. And of course, it goes on after that. It doesn't magically stop at 2100, but that's a good benchmark just to think about these changes. But they've gotten higher and higher. NOAA now is eight feet. Um, Richard Alley, who's a uh, glaciologist at Penn State um, University, I think anybody who knows um, ice science would, argue, would say that, would agree with me that he's probably the most respected, most esteemed ice scientist in the world, lead author in all the IPCC stuff. Uh, by the way, a conservative and a Republican, not exactly a kind of crazy radical tree hugger guy. Um, and he told me uh, on the phone, because uh, of the stuff I'm going to talk about in Antarctica, in Antarctica, that we can't rule out 15 feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. And the reason is because of what's happening in Antarctica. Greenland, people have a, scientists have a pretty good handle on, more or less. But up until about 10 years ago, scientists thought Antarctica was pretty stable. It's cold down there. There's not a lot of surface melting. We thought, well, not we, scientists thought that Antarctica was not an issue. But now they, what we've figured out is that they've figured out is that it is a real issue. And it's much less stable than that we understood a, a decade ago. I just got back uh, about six weeks ago from a two-month trip to Antarctica. It was literally called an emergency research mission with scientists from the National Science Foundation and the British Antarctic Survey to look. This was the ship I was on, actually. And this is a photo of the ship from a drone. And I like the photo because it's, the, it's, it's um, the one picture that I, well, I have numbers of pictures, but that really shows you the scale of things down there. And these are all just icebergs floating around uh, us. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. But um, it was an amazing trip. But it was really the whole trip, the whole point of the trip was to figure out how quickly West Antarctica, in particular, is, is um, beginning to fall apart. And when we think about Antarctica, it's a big continent as big as the US and Mexico together. The real issue is on the west coast. And the real, real issue is one little, well, not little, a glacier the size of Florida, 
um, called Thwaites Glacier, which is like a kind of cork in the whole West Antarctic ice sheet. And if it begins to fall apart, they're concerned that the most, much of West Antarctica could go in very quickly. And there's 10 feet of sea level rise just in West Antarctica, 10 feet of sea level rise. So um, there was a lot of concern about that. And that's what we were down there looking at. And I want to talk a little bit about, just very briefly, because this is a really important kind of fundamental science-y point, about in Greenland, I think most people know that ice melts like, you, like you, know, you put an ice cube on a picnic table. It's hot. It melts. Surface, it's surface melting. There's more complexity to it, of course, than that when it comes to glaciers. But basically, that's, that's, how, that's the, the dynamic to, you can think about. Um, in Antarctica, what's happening is something very different. Uh, in West Antarctica. What's happening in West Antarctica has to do with the fact that West Antarctica is like a bowl shape. You have this grounding line. You have these marine glaciers that come up to the edge of the continent like this, and then you have a long downslope behind it. And what the scientists are figuring out is that you know ice will melt at a certain rate, but it can also go into the water in a different way, which is by collapsing. There's a thing called marine ice shelf instability, which I won't go into in great detail, but I'll show you some, some these graphics about what we were, what they're concerned about, or what we were re researching while we were down there. So as the ocean is warm, the Southern Ocean is warm just like one degree, even maybe less, but it's enough to shift currents and get more warm water going underneath this, uh, over this grounding line, getting behind and down this downslope under the glacier. It's causing these ice, um, ice shelves to, to break in many cases. These ice shelves work as stabilizing devices for the larger glacier behind it. The ice shelves themselves are already floating and not an issue, but it's the ground-based ice behind that, that, um, er, that we're concerned about. And so this, this process has not really been visible easily from the top because you're not seeing surface melting. But what, what the, the great concern is right now is this, is that as it gets warm underneath, more and more warm water goes underneath, the whole glacier itself becomes destabilized. And instead of melting into the water the way, say, you would think about a, a glacier in Greenland, it can collapse. And you can put, because if it's on a downslope, that collapse can move backward. And at the, uh, back of this glacier, it's about two miles thick. It's an enormous amount of ice, the size of Florida. And this is the kind of thing that um, they're concerned about. And this is why this instability in West Antarctica is basically, for all intents and purposes, why these um, sea level rise projections are getting higher and higher. Because it's like, oh my god, we didn't realize that Antarctica was in play in this way, and it could be in play very quickly. And it's this exact thing why Richard Alley says we can't rule out 15 feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. It doesn't mean it's likely. It's a still a fat tail kind of idea. But the notion that it's even possible, 15 feet of sea level rise is, as you can imagine, just a catastrophe for virtually every coastal city in the world, right? Um, and How does that translate to the ocean? Well, it depends on elevation, right? I mean, if you have long flat, it all depends on the um, kind of gradient, right? So here's the cool and freaky, but as a journalist, very cool thing that happened. Um, we were there studying Thwaites Glacier, as I mentioned. This, is the, this red dot is where we were on the ship on March 2nd. This red dot here is where we were on the ship on March 6th. And look at the difference. We had a, a 25 by 40 mile area of ice shelf melange ice connected to Thwaites Glacier that just kind of collapsed while we were there in real time. It just, all of a sudden we noticed all these icebergs all around us. And it wasn't until we saw the satellite pictures that we realized that we had witnessed, we were witnessing a collapse of this part of the ice shelf. Now it's not like the scientists on the ship or everyone's you know, still deciphering how alarming this is and how much of a departure from natural processes this is and, and all that. But it was a real vivid um, experience for me and a real sign of how enormous changes can happen very, very quickly in this kind of landscape. 
Uh, I want to say a couple things about this. I mentioned this earlier that it's not until the, it's not like the, when the sharks are swimming through the Hilton that it's a problem. Um, it is also, it just takes a little bit of flooding to cause all kinds of problems, especially in places that are not kind of built for it and not prepared for it. Um, one of the big issues that no one thinks about who isn't wading through water barefoot uh, is um, septic systems and sewage. Uh, as soon as you get a little bit of inundation in areas, if you don't have a really good municipal septic sewage, sewage system, and if you have any leaks, those le the, the, uh, you will soon get uh, a lot of uh, really not pretty water. Um, I was wandering through some floodwaters in uh, Miami Beach one day, or actually Miami-Dade County, with a scientist, and he had chastised me for not bringing my rubber boots, and I was like, ah, don't worry about it, it's fine, I can get my feet wet, I get my feet wet all the time. He's like, yeah, okay, sure. And then I, I, uh, we walked through this water, it was like a couple, you know, maybe a mid-calf. Mid, mid and after we were done, he did some sampling of bacteria level. And the bacteria level in the water was 30,000 times the state recommended level. So I took like 12 showers that night and <laughs> scrubbed really well. But kids are playing in this water. And you, you don't have to think a lot about the consequences of high bacteria counts in these floodwaters. So when you think of floodwaters, even small amounts of floodwaters, it's not like pristine water that's coming, being you know, kind of poured out of an Aquafina bottle into your streets, right? Um, this is something that is uh, uh, already becoming an issue, which is um, in places like Rhode Island and is a huge issue in actually driving attention towards this, which is, a, I feel like a real estate consultant a lot of the time. Everybody asks me, should I sell, should I buy? Um, but this question of um, the impact on real estate values on in coastal cities and coastal communities. Again, it's not like it's a problem when it happens. It's as soon as people process this, as soon as people think, including when I say people, I mean banks too, start thinking about, oh, 30-year mortgage on a place that might have you know, twice as much flooding or three times or five times as much flooding in 10 years, and then what will its value be in 30 years? How am I going to write a mortgage for this? How am I going to think about a mortgage for this? People will begin to start pricing this into real estate values. And people I, I know, I went to, when on my book tour, I was in um, North Carolina, and uh, I was in a, a, a mountain community and there were like 300 people turned up at my talk and I was like why are you all here I mean I know it's a good book but you know <laughs> why are you here and it's because they had fled the Outer Banks many of them had sold their houses in the Outer Banks they wanted to get out now all the real estate values were high they didn't want to lose a couple hundred thousand dollars as people begin to process this all, all in as um, right now flood insurance is a big issue I won't go into that but flood insurance is artificially low because of for a lot of reasons so as soon as that, that will, not end, will not continue, that will end, real estate uh, insurance prices will go up. The, the, the real estate part of this is already happening, as this shows, and this is only going to accelerate in a big, very big way. And the, the problem is, the problem is not just that you or I, who owns our coastal house, might lose $100,000 or $50,000 or $20,000 or $300,000 on their real estate, it's the, implications for the community themselves. So as real estate values begin to fall, it's exactly the same moment when they, communities need to start spending more money for infrastructure, for better sewage, for seawalls, for all the kinds of things, drainage, all the kinds of things that are required to um, uh, deal with sea level rise at the same decline as you have declining revenues. So it's a real kind of Detroit-like problem for, for coastal communities that is already beginning to happen. Then, of course, you have displaced people, which uh, is a recipe for all kinds of uh, uh, political turmoil, as we know. Uh, I want to say something about this idea that we're just going to adapt to all this. It's all very simple. Uh, I think billions of dollars are going to be spent on adaptation and preservation. Some of it will be well spent. A lot of it will, be, will not. There will be bazillions of dollars blown on dumb, dumb engineering ideas. I can already see that. Um, Miami Beach is spending $500 million with a drainage pump system that's sort of on hold now, but has done some, they're elevating sidewalks and things, it's, it's done, it's helped a little bit. 
There's already been an enormous amount of pushback. It's changing the, the uh, fabric of the communities. People don't want, and also people don't want pumps in their, town, in their neighborhoods because they make too much noise. It's a very complicated thing um, that even in the beginning in Miami Beach is already causing a lot of pushback. Um, you know, you can raise, people can raise houses. That's obviously doable. This is a picture in Jersey Shore. Um, and it's fine. You can, that person will probably be fine for a while. Um, but it's not just about your house, right? It's about the community. Do you want to have, live in the elevated house and the, per, and the house around, below, beneath you, you know, is swamped and full of mold and the roads are, are flooded all the time and you can't get there and the hospital's shut down because it has problems. So it's not just about what do you do for your piece of property. It's also about what happens to the community around you. This was a, a thing called the Big U that they were going to do in Lower Manhattan. Building walls are always a thing. Um, walls are very 20th century when it comes to thinking about adaptation to sea level rise. There's a huge social justice issue with all of this. It's cool to be behind the wall if you're on 40, you know, 39th Street, but if you're on 40, 46th Street, you're like, why didn't the wall come to me? Why, what's, you know? And then if you're in Red Hook, you're like, well, why didn't you have a Danish architect and spend $10 billion on, with a Danish architect to build uh, a wall around Red Hook, and not just Lower Manhattan. So there's all kinds of issues with wall building that are a problem. We just learned that uh, we spent, what, uh, $14 billion uh, uh, with levees and dike systems uh, in New Orleans after Katrina. We've just learned that in as little as, what, four years, it's going to be obsolete because of the subsidence. Uh, and so they're going to have to re-engineer this whole thing. A great example of, of how these mega engineering projects are very problematic. This is my favorite. This is the uh, Mosey system in Ven Venice. Um, one of the engineers I was with called it this Ferrari on the seafloor. It's this giant wall that um, is invisible most of the time. And then when there's high tides or storm surges and stuff, it comes up like this. It's, it cost about six and a half billion dollars. About a billion of that went to ski condos and diamond rings for various, you know, uh, girlfriends. Uh, I think 200 people went to prison uh, for, this it is it's, it's an Italian construction project. Um, <laughs> no, I love Italy, no, no. But, um, but the problem is, is that they spent 25 years engineering this, spent six and a half billion dollars, and it's only engineered for eight inches of sea level rise. So it's basically going to be obsolete by the time they get it finished. And, and it's not easy to think about in fact, it's almost impossible to think about how you add to it to, um, for, to make it sort of future-proof. So all these big engineering projects are very problematic. And then you have the problem, as I mentioned, it's not just the house, it's the airports, it's the railroads. Um, I spent a lot of time at Norfolk Naval Base, the largest naval base in the world. They have plenty of money. Uh, the, Norfolk is in big trouble, it's subsiding. Uh, I was on the... Uh, um, deck of one of the battleships with Secretary Kerry, uh, then Secretary of State John Kerry, who understands all this very well. He asked the head of the base, how much time does this base have? The head of the ba base said 20 to 40 years, which when you think about this, 75,000 people working there, biggest naval base in the world, head, you know, um, center for all of our operations uh, in the Gulf and, uh, and in, in Europe. That's a huge issue. And the Navy could do whatever they want, right? I mean, they can raise all the, de all of the piers. They can put seawalls up. They can do all kinds of things. But what they're figuring out is that it doesn't help if the, no one can get to the base because the roads are underwater, if the railroads getting, bringing munitions and other supplies to the base are underwater. So it becomes that it, saving the base requires you to save the entire region of Virginia somehow. And that's a whole other thing. And it really illustrates the fact that sort of we're all in this together in a certain way. There's these big fixes that everyone asked about. I wrote a book about, about geoengineering, which I'll talk about in questions if you want. Not worth going into now, but it's not, the, the short version of it is it's not a fix for sea level rise. It can help cool things down. It can slow the heating. It's all kinds of problems, but it's not a fix um, for sea level rise. Um, last thing I want to go through, because one of the things that I found in this book was that I met a lot of like really cool architects, urban planners, designers who are coming up with really interesting ideas for how to deal with living on water, living with water, 
Um, this was a, a community center that this Dutch Nigerian ar um, architect built in the water slums that I mentioned in Lagos. Um, it was a very simple structure on you know, 55 gallon drums and very simple, but it was a huge, it was just a great example of um, uh, kind of new thinking about how one would build a community center. And it was a hugely popular, unfortunately it blew down in a storm, um, but they're rebuilding it now sort of stronger than before. But there's all kinds of really interesting uh, ideas, you know? I mean, this is a friend of mine who's a architect in Miami who has the idea about these platform cities in Biscayne Bay using technology for oil drilling rigs and things. Of course, you could imagine that working and you could imagine that being a really nice, lovely place to live, right? Um, so the problem is, is sort of n not imagining how we could live with water. The problem is imagining what we're gonna do with all the stuff we've already built and where we already are and how we're gonna make that transition to a, a different kind of coastal life. One of the solutions that they're coming up with in New York, they just announced they're going to kind of really get rid of the wall as I'd shown in that, in that earlier slide and build out on the land. They're gonna fill in the bay more. Most cities in Boston, you know, New York, San Francisco, not to mention of course Shanghai and Singapore and everywhere else has built on land around, they filled in around the, the islands or the communities that they started on. And that's what they're going to do in New York because it helps to it would help to finance the project. So they're going to build out into the East River, into the Hudson, into the harbor, higher. Uh, they haven't disclosed the actual plans for development, but you know they're going to develop it, and that's how they're going to fund this expansion. And it, and it kind of makes sense. I mean, Lower Manhattan's already been expanded a lot. It's it's, it's sort of a, um, a smart way of thinking about it. And this is what they're doing in the Maldives. They're just building new land. They're just using dredges and stuff to build new land. And that's, they're doing this a lot in Asia. And it makes a lot of sense. It's like, we're starting over because we know we have to think differently about this. So we're building new places. Um, again, it's great, except for all the stuff that one's left behind. Um, so I want to end this with what were, for me, the big questions about thinking about this and that I kind of came to at the end of my uh, journey uh, on this book. One was, um, when are we gonna get serious about cutting carbon? That's the question I've been asking as long as I've been writing about climate change. Um, no evidence that we're getting serious about it. I mean, there's lots of talk, solar energy is cheap, all that kind of thing. If you look at the only measurement that matters, which is the metric of CO2 levels in the atmosphere, it just goes up and up and up. There's no sign that we're getting anywhere near serious about it. So because that will have obviously enormous implications for all the climate change impacts. Um, I think this is a really important question. When does the real estate market collide with climate science? How, when, when does this devaluation that we're already starting to see really hit home? And when do people really realize, oh my God, my house on the beach is gonna be worth nothing in 10 years or in 15 years or maybe half as much and what am I gonna do about that? You know, what, if you have a house in Nantucket, what are you, what are you gonna do, you know? Um, that is going to, going to drive, I think, a lot of interest and coverage and thinking about this, because the economics are very brutal. Um, where is the money for adaptation going to come from? So to all these projects, you know, that you can do uh, to help adapt from, you know, the, not just the dumb ones, but the smarter ones of, of improving drainage and short-term things that can help buy more time. Um, it's easy to see where the revenue funds for solar panels come from. You build a cheaper solar panel, everybody buys it. It's harder to see where the revenue for adaptation comes from. It's going to bankrupt local communities and governments very, 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 very quickly. The federal government, of course, right now has no interest in, in even talking about this, much less funding anything about this. You know, philanthropies can help a little bit, but they're not going to, you know, philanthropy is not going to save Miami, much less Miami, New Orleans, Galveston, Norfolk, Boston, and everywhere else, right? So what is, is, can you figure out a private revenue stream? Is there a way to channel you know, private money into this? And there's a lot of interesting thinking about green bonds and things, but, but that's a real question. How quickly we start building walls and starting to live with water? I mean, I think there's a lot of impulse right now to just put up walls. We'll just deal with this by putting up a wall. Um, and that's, that's not going to work. I mean, the, New Orleans is a great example of that. Um, but we have to fundamentally change our thinking about coastal living and this idea, even the Dutch have come up with this new notion of uh, what they call living with water uh, because that's the lesson that was in Lagos that I saw. 
was these communities, they live with water. They can build their houses higher or lower, they can change, it's all flexible. They're living with the water, and that's how we're going to live on coastal communities in the future. And then I think one of the hardest uh, questions about all this is who decides what and who will be saved? And I mean, uh, I talk to a lot of preservation societies. Um, there's a big issue with uh, historic preservation. Cities like Charleston are in huge trouble. Um, you know, what do you do with historic districts? There's, th that's an issue in many cities and communities around. But also with people, like how, we can't, well, we're not gonna buy everybody out. There's a lot of people who can't afford to move who are, who are living in high risk areas um, for a variety of reasons, whether it's jobs or sentimental connections or whatever. How do we deal with you know, what is called uh, managed retreat? I mean, no, no political, no mayor, no civic leader wants to preside over the sort of evacuation or decline of their community. And yet that's what's going to have to happen because there's not going to be a way to save everyone else, uh, save everyone. You can't, the, the and economic uh, implications alone are so huge. So how are we gonna make these decisions of who gets reimbursed, who gets moved, who doesn't get moved? Um, these, I think, uh, are very big questions, as well as the larger losses of um, personal things, emotional things. I mean, it's interesting for me, the number of people who come up to me and just talk about a particular beach or something that they spent their childhood on, or like, you know, is that beach gonna be there? And like, I can't imagine it not being there because that's where I kissed my first girlfriend, you know? And, and it's not, I mean, it sounds silly, but it's not. I mean, it's, it's like, um, you know, cemeteries going under, I mean, uh, you know, all kinds of historic places being lost, uh, you know, Cape Canaveral. I mean, just lots of places, cultural and personally, uh, interesting, I mean, the um, cultural and personal echoes that nobody really thinks about because we think about this in sort of economic and political terms so much. So, um, so there we go. Uh, that's my sort of take on the big picture of uh, the book I wrote um, about a little bit my, about my experience and I'm now happy to take questions about anything. Uh, thanks for coming, Jeff. Really interesting stuff. Um, speaking as a journalist, what are some tactics that you've used that have made people actually care about these issues? Um, good question. <laughs> um, just, my smart ass answer was I'm not sure that I have. <laughs> um, because I think, I mean, I've seen a big change actually in awareness. I, I you know, as a journalist, I try to, um, uh, tell human stories, uh, make this as human as possible, write about the experiences of uh, people uh, rather than, you know, data, um, make this relevant in that way. You know, this book was challenging because it's about what a lot of people perceive as being a future event. And so I wanted to really show that it was here and now. And so I really focused on like a lot of what, not about the projections of sea level rise and things like that, but about how people are dealing with this in the here and now and, and capturing some, some of that drama. Um, I think that, uh, I think one of the effective tactics I did in this book was basically saying, uh, I'm not here to d discuss whether global warming is, climate change is real or not. I'm not here to convince you whether, you know, you should believe in it, I hate that phrase, but you know, uh, is, this is a given, and if you want to talk about that, we'll go read a different book, you know? I mean, I think focusing on like, okay, this is really happening, and here's how it's happening right now, um, 
was a part of my strategy. And, and trying to build a narrative, especially in a book, it's hard to do that because I think a lot of, for me, a lot of climate writing is too data driven and too issue driven. So in a, in a uh, kind of very loose way, I tried to make the book about a, a kind of narrative starting early in time with Noah's flood and all that kind of thing and thinking about flooding in the past and then moving on through the future. Um, I think that, you know, I started out, I went to, I didn't mention this, but I went to Columbia as a fiction writer. Um, and I quickly gave up on that because I realized that I would be, it was really like about spending my life bartending. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was not a fiction writer. But I, a lot of the techniques of fiction writing I think are really important in thinking about and, uh, and narrative and human and psychological drama and things like that. Yeah. Have you, in your, in your research, have you seen a plans on, the, you, you use the word adaptation, but um, an actual adaptation of abandoning coasts and rebuilding cities inland that answer some of the serious logistics questions? I mean, it's a trillion dollar issue, but is anybody, are groups, academics, or think tanks, or governments thinking about that or actually putting together plans of that type? Well, I mean, you know, this Gulf Coast, the, the, the Gulf Coast Restoration Plan, which was, has just been released in various iterations, comes closest to that. Um, but it's still all about sort of small, highly at risk communities. You know, no one is that I'm aware, I'm sure people are thinking about it in, you know, uh, the middle of the night kind of thing. But in a, in a real planning way, no one is thinking about, okay, we're going to move Miami to Kansas and, you know, this is how it's going to work, or to Orlando, or something like that. You know, um, but I, you know, I, I I spent time with the mayor of Flagstaff, Arizona, and she was talking about, you know, preparing Flagstaff for you know incursions of people coming out of Phoenix and from the Gulf Coast because of climate change. And I think that there's actually, in the last year or so, a lot more conversation about this. People are going to make different choices about where they live, whether it's sea level rise or drought or fires or whatever. And, you know, how are we going to prepare for that? Um, and I think that's happening on a local level in ways that hasn't really been talked about very much, but it is actually happening. You've spoken a lot about the um, mean sea level rise and the impact that that will have largely on coastal communities. But we're also facing an increase in the frequency and intensity of large storms that will deliver large amounts of rain inland, hundreds of kilometers. Right. Can you, is that a small problem compared to the coastal one or similar magnitude? Well, I mean, what we're, look at what we're seeing right now in the Midwest, right? And uh, no, it's not a small problem. And, it, and they work, the two work together. And uh, Houston was a great example of that. You know, you had torrential you know, rain, I forgot the number of inches in 24 hours, but Harvey was basically a, a rain event. But as sea levels rise, rivers have a harder time draining. Uh, and so that water gets more, gets trapped. It's, it, it accentuates um, the problems. I don't think that I can make a kind of like, you know, better or worse hazard judgment. I mean, to, you know, if, if you're in Miami, inland flooding is not a big, in Iowa is not a big issue. If you're in Iowa, Inland flooding because of precipitation is a big issue. So it depends on, on what your risks are. But you know, these are both you know, prime evidence of how fast our world is changing and further evidence that climate change is not a future event. It's a real-time event that's happening now that's only going to accelerate. Have you, have you found anywhere, hi, I'm over here. Hi, um, have you found anywhere in the United States where a real estate market has really seriously started to turn as people begin to realize this risk? I work in Charleston, um, which is in the midst of a period of historic growth right yeah. now, uh, and no one seems to be thinking about this reality which is gonna come, which is already coming and is only gonna get worse um, within decades. Uh, so does anyone really thinking seriously about it? Um, you know, or, I mean, or a real estate market that's actually been seriously impacted where people are 
Well, I mean, you're starting to see it. You know, the, I mean, this is a very new idea, right? So this study that I just cited came out last year by uh, some real estate consultants that are beginning to look at this. You know, you're not seeing any, as far as I know, any kind of giant collapse of the markets yet. But what you're starting to see is gradual relocation, gradual change, gradual devaluation of more at-risk areas. Miami, there's been a lot of recent studies. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but you know, showing that, that real estate in the lower-lying areas are you know, increasing in value quite a bit less quickly than, than other places. And it's not, a, it's not like speculative. I mean, it's going to happen. It's, you know, these places are going to be worthless. I mean, when I walk along Miami Beach, you know, I used to go there and see like, you know, uh, interesting architecture and all that. And, you know, I see stranded assets now. I mean, when I look at Miami Beach, I look at stranded assets. I mean, it ju and not just Miami Beach, but that's just the obvious example. Because in any scenario, these, virtually any scenario, these places are going to be radically devalued. And it's a question of when and how that devaluation happens. So this real estate adjustment is coming one way or another. And maybe it'll be slow for the next decade. Or maybe a big chunk of Antarctica will fall into the water and people will go, oh shit, <laughs> this is real. I'm getting the hell out of here, you know? I, I mean, I think that there's a, you know, Mark Carney at the Bank of England has made a strong case about uh, risk and financial assets of stranded assets, not just real estate, that's one part of it, but also investments in fossil fuel infrastructure, fossil fuel reserves, that there's a, what essentially is a carbon bubble. And that as soon as that we get serious about climate change or some we have some dramatic impacts from climate change that causes people to reevaluate their investments, a lot of people are going to be left in, you know, in, with, with not as much as they thought. Um, uh, two uh, questions, which are uh, not short. Uh, one is, the, you, uh, fa first of all, fantastic book, wonderful presentation. From the presence of the people in the room, you can tell the importance of advancing this. You didn't mention this whole effort of science denial of EPA scientists being forced to cancel conferences and not publish reports, and uh, the sort of uh, denial effort by the oil industry or whomever, dark money, to deny the science. And the second big question related to the very last question you raised there is we have this paralysis of leadership because our politicians who wish to go in the right direction don't feel they have sufficient community support to be reelected. And I remember some time ago I read uh, you had uh, spoken of President Obama asking you for to have the public push them. Right. Um. So the first question about why I didn't talk about kind of climate denial, well, I mean, I went like eight minutes over anyway. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that's a whole other talk. And, I, and frankly, to be honest, I'm like tired of talking about that. I'm really not interested in talking about that. It's like I don't want to talk to you about why the earth isn't flat, you know? I mean, you want to have that conversation? Go have it with somebody else. I'm not, I mean, I'm just not, I, I've, nothing I can say to anybody in three minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, half an hour is going to change anyone's mind about that. There are people who are really good at talking about that, and want to talk about it, I don't. I want to talk to people who understand that climate change is real, that I don't have to explain the physics of it and all that, but don't understand the real implications of it and the real urgency of it. So that's who I'm really thinking about talking about. Um, second question about political will, yes, Obama did say, I need people to make me do it. I need political support for this. The problem, you know, with this are t there's t is twofold. One is it's a long-term issue in the sense of like, you know, it's a hard for a congressman or woman or a senator or something. You, of course, have a great senator here. Sheldon Whitehouse is by far 100 miles the best politician in America, maybe Jay Inslee also. Uh, on this issue. He's fantastic, relentless, incredibly knowledgeable. I mean, if I could make a king for our country, it would be him. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, but, you know, you live in Wonderland. 
You know, most of America is not like that. Most, virtually all politicians in America are in one way or another bought off by fossil fuel money. And so it's not just about the difficulty of long-term decisions, it's also because of funding from the fossil fuel industry and political corruption and things like that. So it's a very, the politics of this are very complex. And you know, when I go around the country, I don't actually meet that many climate deniers. Most of the climate deniers I know are all in Washington, D.C., right? <laughs> so um, this is a, you know, others have said that climate change is really a problem of democracy not technology or science or something. And it's true. Uh, on, on that kind of level, it really is true.